and hello B-Sides Leads. Thanks for coming to my talk, which if you have read through the abstract is not that technical in nature, but I think it is still very relevant to us as the security industry. And the fun thing, if you just have attended Zoe's keynote, is that I think some of the parts I'm talking about will fit in nicely with uh, what she was talking about. So I think if you have been in the industry long enough, you've heard people calling users, losers, users, layer 8 problem, pep cac, which is problem exists between keyboard and chair. And we found a lot of condescending ways to talk about the funny antics of those people without really ever thinking about how to make it better or how to make them relevant for security. So putting box after box after box in your network is something that vendors at InfoSecurity and other uh, conferences want you to do because it's the next box, it's going to address your next problem and so on and so forth. If you're in the happy position that your company is doing that and buying box after box, then your security operations center will look a lot like that. Some people with lots of dashboards with some kind of information that might be relevant or it might not be relevant. And I don't see an end to this cycle because there's a new box coming out every year, probably every, every month. And in the end, I think... Uh, that humans matter. This uh, is a talk I originally did with Brian Feit, and this is also um, his motto for, for his conference. And humans matter in a lot of different ways, and they are our users, they are our colleagues, and we need to get them on board. And I'm going to use the word cyber, and I know that some of you in the industry hate the word cyber, but I can only kindly ask you to watch a talk by Dr. Jessica Barker from B-Sides London in 2016, I think. And uh, it is about us, the InfoSec industry, not really embracing that word, but all our customers using that word mostly exclusively and trying to meet them halfway. And this is also how where, where this talk is roughly going. So you might not have heard about the big pizza wars in Germany about five years ago. So the thing was, when you tried to order some fast food via the internet, via the web, on a Saturday, chances were you, well, well, you didn't get any. Because the biggest chains were DDoSing each other at prime time so that they could get the orders. But they were all doing it, so... As an affected person who was hungry, you couldn't get any food. And, of course, there was WannaCry, or still is, I guess, which affects lives as well. And mainly it hit um, hospitals in Britain. Uh, but there were a lot of people affected by that as well. And one very specific example I would like to tell you is um, it's about swatting. So, swatting is a word I didn't really know existed until a few years ago. And SWAT is for the special weapons and assault teams in the United States. And the act of swatting is you call the SWAT team on somebody else. So, to be fair, when I was young, uh, it was funny to call something, some delivery service, and see them how they... Um, pulled up at the neighbor's driveway and the neighbor was very confused because he didn't know about anything. That's fun when you're 14 years old. But in this case, two people, person A and person B, were haggling about <coughs> $1.50 over a skin for Call of Duty, which is an online game. Person A was so disgruntled that person B didn't pay up that he hired person C to swat person B. What person C did, um, he called the police. He acted as if it was a very violent situation, as if the son had already murdered parts of his family, I think his father, and was now threatening to kill the rest. So if you are the police, you don't have a choice. You have to act upon that, because you don't know whether it's a prank or not. 
And usually this is the kind of prank that nobody in their right mind does. So they pulled up to a house and they rang the bell or knocked and somebody opened. And that somebody was very surprised because it was not person B, because person B gave a false address, basically. So it was a totally innocent person and he saw the police staring at him. And for reasons unknown, he reached for his waistband, maybe to scratch his ass or something like that. But people thought he was reaching for a gun. So they killed him. So you have a situation um, about $1.50 where somebody who was not even playing online games, who I think he owned a computer, but he didn't uh, do a lot with it, with it, was totally innocent, got shot by a police officer. And to be fair, that police officer has to deal with the trauma as well. So you impact a lot of innocent lives. So it's not a question of how cyber impacts the physical domain. It does. And it doesn't matter whether you are online or not. Because in the case of, of WannaCry and others, uh, you are affected whether you are a person who likes to surf the internet or not. The thing is, the one thing where I think we can make a difference <laughs> is to give our colleagues, and I still call them users in the presentation, but the point that Zoe made, or that the person asking the question made was very good, um, it should be empowering colleagues, because users has this negative connotation to it. This is our way out. This is our way out of the misery uh, that we face in the security industry. We really need to get those people on board, or we will constantly fail. Because, basically, I don't know whether you agree with me, but as doing security for everything and securing everything, we are kind of in a rat race and we are not really succeeding in winning and putting an end to it and saying, hey, now we're secure. We don't need to do anything anymore. And I think getting the users on board is a big step. So how do we do, uh, do that? <coughs> I'm guessing that a lot of you have heard that pen test is tale of uh, if you want to get into a network, you just drop a USB drive at the parking lot Somebody will plug it in and you get access to the network. Has more or less everybody heard that story? I hope so. At least some of you are nodding. I take that as a yes. So what do you do when you find something like a USB drive? As an attacker, you can be very creative. So you can target different kinds of emotions. First thing would be you put a little plushie, a little teddy bear, to the USB drive and a set of keys. So people will think that is uh, the keychain of somebody who lost just uh, his keys to his home and will try to return it. How do you do that? You have a look at the USB drive to see what's on it. Maybe there are photos, names, something to help you to help the person. Because I also think that humans at the basic level will try to help each other normally. Nobody is going to agree on that, and that's fine, but um, it's okay. Or you can target uh, greed. So label it <coughs> expenses. Nah, that's so 2018. Label it, um, no, it's 2017. Actually, I was going to say label it Bitcoin wallet, but I'm not really sure whether Bitcoin um, plays such a big role. But last year, that time, if you labeled it Bitcoin wallet, somebody would plug it in. And, you know, without a show of hands, just go inside yourself and, and ask yourself the question, if I found a USB drive that piques my interest, would I plug it in? Oh, hell yeah, of course. But you in this room and others would do it in a very safe environment, and our users probably wouldn't do that. So why not give them the safe environment? This is something we built at our company. So apologies, because it's a German um, desktop. It says virus detention station, more or less. So we built this not to deter attackers, but this is a very positive and good side effect. The initial idea is a tale of very unnecessary, complicated processes, and I'm giving you insight into the pain of working for a really big company. So when you were preparing a presentation on a USB drive, for example, at home, and you brought the drive with you to the office on the next day. You couldn't plug it in because it's forbidden to plug in USB drives to your work PC, which is sensible, which is good. So you put it in an envelope 
you handed it over to the secretary, she handed it over, or he, to the internal postal services. They would drive it to a different building. It would be scanned. Some magic would happen. And the process would go vice versa. And the USB drive would land safely on your desk about four workdays later. So when we're talking four workdays, that is not really agile. That is not really something you want to deal with. I mean, we are slow in our processes, but this was ridiculous. So um, colleagues came up with the idea of that um, virus detention station, where basically you plug in any kind of USB drive you see, then you can list the contents and you can say, this file and that file I'd like to have in my inbox at work, or a link to a network share, basically. And then it gets transported via sandboxes, via wire scanners, and via different ways. And the magic that happened here basically happens elsewhere without human involvement. And the time it takes you from going upstairs from that wireless detention station to your workplace, um, you would already have the link. So you can just continue to work. And we found out, hey, that's cool. Because basically now people can plug in any drive they want, even if they found it even if this is a pen tester's or an attacker's attempt to get into the network. They could do that. So, because we're a big company, let me tell you what our current process is. <clears throat> if somebody finds an unknown USB drive, they are supposed to hand it over to building security. So, what's your guess what building security will do with that? Plug okay. in. No? It's far more ridiculous. They are going to hand it over to the local lost and found, which is about, I don't know, two or three miles away, and nobody will bother to go there and say, you know, I've lost my USB drive. Yeah, how, what does it look like? Mm, black. <laughs> so we are trying, we are, currently we are trying to get that process to work, that they actually plug it in into the virus detention station, so because it's it's perfectly safe. The next thing we are doing wrong since a long time is the handling of phishing emails, I think. So if I asked you which of those links was malicious, what's your answer? Potentially all, but basically none. Because I forgot what the first one is, I just remembered it is safe. Um, so you have to take my word on that, and I know that he won't do that. but. Amazon.com with a zero instead of an O is actually um, redirecting to Amazon. And the last one is just the IP address of uh, our website from our company. So the point I'm trying to make is even as researchers, even as people who know this, their stuff, it has become terribly hard to say what is a phishing link and what is not. Because uh, if you go, go to link shortness like um, Bitly or, or others, how can you actually tell without clicking it where it re redirects to. You basically can't. So Brian and I came up with uh, something we like to call indicators of bullshit. I apologize for the language, but if you know me and talk to me in person, I'm very mild in this presentation. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the indicators of bullshit, and this is meant to be <coughs> for our employees, when you get an email, you don't look at the headers. You don't try to force them to read mail headers because, yeah, that could help you understand whether it's a fish or not, but it's a skill they don't want to have and they don't want to learn. So why force them to? But as soon as there's money involved anywhere in that email, that is one indicator of bullshit. And why is that so? Because at the end of the day, <laughs> all the bad guys want money in one form or the other. Maybe they want your data. That's a different beast, but very often money is involved. And the next indicator, of course, are threats, very often combined with, with money. They might be subtle, because it might be something like, yeah, you know, we found out you were streaming this and that video, which is illegal, but we are going for a settlement of just 150 euros or um, pounds sterling or dollars, whatever. If you just pay now, um, else we have to go to the court and it will potentially cost you 2,000 euros or whatever. That's very subtle, but it is a threat. And if you reflect on the regular business emails you get, 
threats are very rarely involved. And if they are, then you know why. So this comes, when this comes out of the blue, this is an indicator. And another thing, and I use the word very loosely, romance, um, assuming <coughs> you get an email out of the blue from a nice Russian lady with pictures <coughs> attached, that she really, she found your profile online. Which one? I've got thousands of sock puppets. Um, should be specific. Uh, and if you get that email, you also know, you know, in a business context, that's probably not really something that's going to uh, be real. Even if I wanted to, maybe, but it's not. And I forgot to say something um, in the beginning. When we talk to our users and colleagues, very often we give them tips and hints for their private cybersecurity. It's not really business related. It's just, you know, if you get spam or phishing emails at home, they look the same. And probably you get more at home because we are filtering stuff in corporate email already. And if you know how to, uh, how to differentiate them from regular emails, from emails you are expecting, then you have that skill and you will use that skill at work as well. And people tend to listen a lot, lot closer if they think they are personally affected. They have more interest. So it's uh, more likely you get a romance email um, at home. And finally, the fourth and last indicator is always some kind of urgency. <coughs> because the way our brains work is uh, they shut down a little bit if you put pressure on them. If you ask somebody, what is your favorite color? then they will think about that and they will give you an answer eventually. But if you say something like, what is your favorite color? You've got three seconds, three, two, one. Um, brain just shuts down. And if you need to say something, you will yell something because it doesn't matter in the end. And again, with the urgency, uh, if you tie it in with the threats and the money, if you say, you know, if you don't pay just now, if you pay any later than in 24 hours, it's going to be $2,000 euros but you get the pictures. Um, and if you have one, two, or three of those indicators of bullshit in an email, just throw it away. And the throwing away part is also very interesting. I still have not found to, uh, have not managed to find a psychological study on this. I believe this to be true. And all the people I talk to about that believe that to be true, but I have no scientific foundation for that just now. But we trained our users to click things. Basically, the World Wide Web is a collection of things that you can click that lead you to other things that you can click. A little <laughs> bit of info here and there. And in an email, for the internal to-do list for the slightly OCD in our minds, you want to do something with the email. You, if some email comes in, even with those indicators of bullshit, and wants you to force to click something, you have a slight craving to click something. So just add a button that you can click with every email in the business context that forwards the suspicious email to your SOC team or the relevant security team that's going to deal with it. You will satisfy the craving for the user because he or she has clicked something and has dealt with the email, can um, tick an internal box that email has been dealt with one way or the other, and, of course, basically, if you're working in that security team that gets all the phishing and spam emails, your first reaction might be, um, what do I do with them? We found, because we have something similar to that, that is massively helpful. All the newest um, scam outbreaks, new IP addresses, new email addresses, they are getting forwarded to the team that can actually implement them into blacklists, can block them, and can act upon them, although they have to look at spam and phishing emails. Unfortunate, but part of the job, and it gives a lot of helpful insights. And I don't think I'm completely alone with that, because most of the companies running awareness trainings with phishing links and so on, they offer that button as well to mark that as a, as a phish or scam or whatever. Next thing I would like to talk about is reverse social engineering. And again, this is something I really like. This is a story I love. 
Have you heard about the CEO fraud, which is not a technical scam, but it's something where companies lose a lot of money? If you haven't heard about that, it basically works like that. An employee in the company, higher up, or at least someone um, who is able to make huge payments, gets an email, supposedly from the CEO. That email says, hello, your boss said you are the most trustworthy employee. I'm in country X. We want to buy company Z. Can we make a transfer of 500,000 euros, pound sterling, today? If we can, then my lawyer will contact you with all the contact details. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but on the other hand, um, it works. So you get the pressure of hierarchy. You target somebody in the hierarchy who can make those payments, but is probably um, not authorized to, but technically able. And then you get them to transfer the money. And, you know, you might think, that is pretty stupid. Who's going to fall for that? And I can tell you, for example, Google, Facebook, together for $100 million. A company in Nuremberg, where I live, um, fell for it for $40 million. So this really works. And there's no tech involved. So why I'm talking about that here? Because another company in Nuremberg had a very bright idea, and I love that. So it is important to talk to the employees. Though, So the CEO um, said, you know, you will never, ever get an email from me asking for that kind of money transactions. If you do, you take the email, you forward it to your Secure Operations Center. And what they do in return, they slightly alter the email address so they get um, the new emails that the scammer is sending them. And they reply with, oh, hello, CEO. Um, sorry, but you probably forgot. We have that new fabulous payment portal where you can do all the transactions yourself because I'm really technically, uh, I'm not allowed to, but you can do it. Uh, have you lost your login? So as a scammer, you go... That sounds good. Yeah, I've lost my login. And you get login credentials and you get redirected to a payment portal on the website of that company that looks legit. And it kind of is. So you fill in like hmm, half a million, million. Ah, let's go for, for two millions. And most importantly, you fill out the field of the IBAN, which is the account where the money should be transferred to. And what happens? Of course, you don't get any money. That would be stupid. Of course, this Ivan gets on a blacklist. It gets not only blocked in that company, but the bank that has that Ivan gets notified that this is the account of a scammer. The account gets deleted or um, put on ice or things like that. And the scammer loses access to that account. And that is much more hurtful than losing access to an email address or um, a server or whatever, because getting a new bank account up and running is more work and uh, is much more difficult if you have illegal intentions. And I like that because it's just really using social engineering techniques in order to fool those who are going to attack you. And I'm briefly talking about passwords because they are an <coughs> important thing as well. At the company, please, and you know all know that, use strong passwords. Use a password safe. And the reason why I'm saying that is uh, there are still companies who don't allow password saves because they can't, yeah, can't be bothered to buy them or support them or whatever. But the password to the left, except that it is on a slide in a talk at a security conference, but it is a much better password than password one. And I hope you agree with that. But this is nothing I would want to type. So I want to have a password manager that um, actually remembers the password and types it in for me because I can't be bothered. But um, as a as a short as a short side note, um, basically, you've maybe heard about Collection One, which was in the news last week, where uh, Troy Hunt said 778 million user accounts with passwords have been found which is nice, and I'm not trying to incite fear or anything, but Collection 1 is the first one in the collections that we found. And it's one of the smaller ones. 
And all in all, it's way more than 778 billion, uh, million. All in all, without checking whether it makes sense or not, it was something like 30 million passwords. <coughs> and the trouble with that is your new password that you're thinking of competes with all the passwords that are known. Not your passwords, but somebody somebody else came up with, uh, because the hash is known. If the hash isn't sorted, you can just um, check it up in a database, and even if it's a good password, if somebody else used it, then basically you're screwed. And that's, again, something you should use a password manager and complex, long passwords in the company. Now, if you have tar and feathers, then I totally expect some of you to use them on me after that. But in your family, with your granddad, with your mother, elderly people, friends who are not as internet savvy as you, how to, do you deal with passwords? Sure, still, strong passwords, password safes are great, still. But my point is, let them write them down in a notebook. Because this is not an advice for your workplace. It is a bad, shitty advice for your workplace. That's why I want to make it clear that is for private homes. If you write down passwords, they tend to be better than password1 or apple123 or 1234 or if you really want to be very secure, 12345. If you let them write down passwords, you get the chance that they use a different password for different websites and that it is good. And let's think about that. If there's a person standing next to your granny's computer having her password book in hand, they are not after the passwords. They broke in to steal valuables. They are not really interested in the, in the Facebook password of um, those friends. And even if there was a break-in and uh, somebody stole the password account, then you can start replacing all the passwords. Of course, at work, that's a different kind of story because many people will pass by your desk and you can't do that. But for private reasons, um, many people in the industry bash um, stuff like that. And I think, you know, you have to take a step in the direction of where your users are or where those people are in order to get a result. Otherwise, they will use password one everywhere where they can because they can't write it down and they have to remember it. And um, if you can get them to get two-factor authentication, that's great. This, by the way, is a fully functioning mobile phone. Uh, you can use that for two-factor authentication. Um, this, I've been told, is very popular in prisons. I wonder why. <laughs> um, and at the end, I'm... I can't believe that I'm using that person as a as an example, but if you think your granny's security is not good enough, then just think about that. And he's the president. Is he still the president? I think. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Right. One other thing we are working on, but I haven't seen that in the wild yet because there are legal reasons why this could be problematic. It's mail forward as a service. So we identified or we say that uh, for private people, their email address, they very often just have one email address, and that is the most valuable digital asset. Because if you have access to the email account, you can reset all the other accounts on any platform whatsoever. You get the um, reset notifications, and then you can just log in. So if you have someone's email account, then it's pretty much game over for the person if they only have one um, in private. So the idea was to register a domain as the company. It doesn't have to do something, uh, doesn't need to have to do something with uh, your actual company name, just any domain and use it as a mail forwarder. So your user a at um, myhomeemail.com would have a at uh, the company's domain.com or email domain. The question is, why? It's very easy. If you register with that email address at different portals and this portal gets breached, then they only have the forwarder email address. And this is of no use of somebody who wants to reset other platforms. So it might be another level of security. But if you have a bright idea about that, uh, just let me know. Because the problems we have at the moment is we are in discussion with what happens when that person leaves the company. Will they still get access to that email address? Will it still be forwarded? 
Um, and the administrative overhead to that is not even funny for a gym. So, yeah. <laughs> so we haven't done that yet. And one thing Zoe in her keynote uh, was also talking about, and I'm, again, I'm, I'm very happy I, she had a few points that I'm going to make as well, but I didn't rewrite the slides just in the last 10 minutes, uh, is making awareness training interesting. I hope that none of you have to sit through shitty awareness trainings at work. I'm pretty sure a lot of you have to sit through shitty awareness trainings at work. But the thing is, we, I just think that we do, but most of us like security, else we wouldn't be here at B-Sides, I guess. And even we find security trainings exhausting sometimes, especially when they are done wrong. And believe me, you've got nothing on wrong security awareness trainings when it comes to some stuff my company does. As I said, we are changing that because it's really not working, but it's a different department, so I can bash them. Yay. Um, <laughs> first thing, of course, is avoiding fear, uncertainty, and doubt. As with a, with a collection one and everything, this is something that can easily lead to fear. But on the other hand, sometimes some people need to have the facts. And it's the way they are presented, whether you can actually create the facts and, and create the understanding of the danger that is out there without actually saying we are all doomed. Um, use password one because it doesn't matter anyway. Yeah. Uncertainty and doubt, much of the same. If you can try to avoid that, then people get a rational, get to make a rational decision about what they are doing and um, can have a look at it in a very different way. If you ever sat through a multiple choice click fest, then you know that this isn't working for security. This is just there so that one department can tick off a box. Yes, we do security awareness trainings for our employees. And I tick the box and I get the certification. Use is zero, in my opinion. I can tell you that at our company, somebody had the idea of uh, gamification. So you need to walk virtually through a virtual training company. It's not even ours. And for example, if there's a fire extinguisher, you need to click it and they need to answer questions about it. Somebody thought that would be fun. It's not. And it doesn't change. We have to do that every year. So it's every year the same stuff. But... We found a shortcut, or no, we didn't find it. Um, people were yelling so loud for a shortcut that they wouldn't have to walk the corridors of the virtual training company because that sucks. They just wanted to have the questions and the answers. But still, you can't get there without reading through all the text that is attached to the various stations. And um, you could do that training in a short amount of time, but since you need to read all that and click, yes, I read that, yes, I read that too, um, it takes time, and usually nobody likes it. So we started to have different kind of engagements with the users, and those are very open, meaning you're free to attend. Um, if you want to attend, and very often it's, it's an open space, so maybe I would talk about something that happened in security in the last few weeks, and people could come and go as they pleased. Because it's, uh, it doesn't have a door. It's in, in an open office. And so if you went there and listened to me and you found out that I'm really boring, that, um, unlike here where you are sitting down and it's, it's awkward to leave, um, in that situation, so you just can leave. And we are engaging with the public as well. The left is a picture where we open the doors. Uh, we have the thing. It's called Long Night of the Sciences in Nuremberg every two years where lots of big companies open their doors and show what they're doing to the public. And that's where we try to get people to understand what we're doing security-wise. And I never thought that, um, I never thought about the effect that has, but we are getting an apprentice uh, in September who said that specifically she went to our company because she liked what we were doing there. So it helps overall. That is my point. And um, Use different channels. Um, I'm writing blog articles. We're doing this open space stuff. We're doing after hour stuff. Um, so if you can offer security training in various formats, then somebody will like one format better than the other and you get more people to engage with you. And 
for the love of everything, if you do stuff after hours, be a decent human being and buy the drinks. Because otherwise, you will be there alone. Um, and it's perfectly understandable. And stalking yourself is something I think is very important as well. Um, what I mean by that, sure, you already pay money to get pen tested. You probably have red team engagements every now and then. But on the other hand, sometimes, depending on the scope, it might not really work that well. And on another note, very often you just look at the network side of things. You are not looking at the social media side of things. So you should have a keen eye on social media as well. Uh, you should hopefully try to monitor what is being said about your company on social media or have a team. But you should also monitor uh, sites like LinkedIn. For example, and the, these are a lot of examples from the company where I work from because um, I'm giving you these examples because they work, um, or I think they work. We had one person on LinkedIn uh, claiming to be from our company and sending a lot of um, connection requests to other people in our company. And since our people in the company are trained in security and are interested in that, they forwarded that to us and said, we find, don't find that person in our internal directory. Are they for real? And we found out, no, they are not. They're probably not preparing an attack on our company, but on one of our customers and would like to pose as somebody from our company. So we got that account shut down rather quickly. And you can only do that if your people are going to give you the info. You know, and that ties in with um, cyber risk management as a whole. If you are interested in that, um, it's not going to be a presentation about the other company I, I'm um, I'm working with. But cyber risk is basically not threats because threats are too immediate and they might be it, it could be too late. Cyber risk is stuff like the social media and see what breached accounts you have and uh, to prepare accordingly if there's something um, coming up from there. So, finding the right language. Again, something Zoe was talking about, and I'm, I'm so really sorry if um, this is not that new, if you listened um, an hour ago, but it's got a new perspective on that as well. Talking to people always works best if you talk from eye to eye. And I mean that in... Uh, in a way that is not condescending, that you let the other person stand as they are, even if you don't agree with them, but you just respect them as a human and you just talk to them and you express what you think and they express what they think and you don't talk down to them so you don't try to be better than them or insult them. You might do that but with friends. But if you really want to get your point across, you need to be taken seriously. And nobody... well. Not nobody, but most people won't take people seriously um, when they are just saying, you have to do that, and you have to be there at 7, and so on and so forth. Because human beings, and hackers especially, if you tell them you have to be X, then what are they going to do? Not be X. Finding the right language. Uh, this is a tweet from last year, from DEF CON. I kind of blurted it out because I don't know whether uh, they are that happy. I mean, it's still online, but I still blurt it out. So there was a person during DEF CON saying if they had the time, budget, and motive to launch really good attacks in Vegas, they would attack, wouldn't would attack random DEF CON nerds because they are powerless and broke anyway. They would go for the black hat attendees because they have money and power. What happened? This person got evicted from hotel security. They later um, got back because DEF CON organizers worked hard with hotel security to say, you know, this guy was not talking about buying an assault rifle and killing people, like what happened in Vegas just a few months before. But yeah, Vegas was on edge. And if you write something like that, and someone reads this without knowing it's cybersecurity and not a regular attack, then they might get nervous. So yeah, avoid um, talking from the top down. And this is another tweet from, I think, last week with um, Videolan. I think it's still up, but I blurred out Scott Helm as well. Um, 
And they were going on about how they perceived the security industry and that they really don't like them. And Scott asked, well, come on, we're not that bad, are we? And they answered with that, yes, you are overall very bad. And I think that is one of the problems, that when we engage with others, we don't take their problems seriously. We try to force security upon them without thinking whether this is something they want, because security is so important to us. We need to find a way to better deal with people. And if that means learning their language and um, going halfway to where they are, then I think that's the case. Nobody who's not totally deeply into security will come to where we are, because all of us are already here, if that makes sense. And then there's um, ritual for ritual's sake. So I thought about an example that will illustrate that. Uh, I think if you think about that, you will come up with examples in your company where somebody is following, following some kind of procedure, not necessarily security, but some kind of process procedure that doesn't make sense at all. Even if you look at the background, maybe it had made sense in the past, but it didn't get abundant, and so people are still doing it. And I uh, found that one from a few weeks ago. And this is, I think, a brilliant example why you shouldn't follow a ritual just for the sake of it. You know, um, it doesn't make sense. And everybody sees it doesn't make sense. But somebody said, you know, people have to uh, check that box because when they buy the car online, they check the box and we have both processes um, should be the same. Doesn't make sense. Another small thing um, is get people to lock their screens because apart from having the password next to it, if you don't lock your screen, it doesn't take long to take over your computer if I'm an adversary. And it doesn't mean I'm typing fast. It just means I've got a USB rubber ducky or any other device that can put in keystrokes at 3,000 characters per second and where I can install a backdoor within seconds. So even if you're just going to the loo and you're alone in the office or somewhere, just try to lock your screen. So how do we do it? Um, actually, I'm not saying how we do it because it's a little bit less good than what I heard from a, from a colleague at a different company. They have a macro. Um, and that macro, actually, it's just executed very quickly in their Windows environment. And it sends a mail to their team that they are inviting them to have a cake the next day. They are going to bring cake. And this is the takeaway, you know, if you send a mail to your team from an unlocked screen, um, I'm buying beer, I'm buying a cake, something like that, something small, then if you are the affected party that didn't lock their screen, usually you go along with it. Um, if you say, you know, um, if you send a mail to the CEO like, haha, you've got a hairy ass, um, that might not be the way to do it. Um, but if you do it in a small small way, like um, buying cake or something, people go along with it. But it is hurtful enough that next time they will lock their screens. I mean, usually, or they buy cake again. I mean, we shall see. And the importance of that is really uh, making the message transparent. If somebody asks, why should I lock my screen? Uh, we have that USB rubber ducky that will... Well, it won't it encrypt your files, but it will encrypt some files that it created beforehand just to demonstrate what you could do with an unlocked PC within seconds. And you should always make a point of educating each individual. There are companies who say, yeah, our security person in Team X, that is her. And it doesn't work like that because there's not one person doing security for all of the people in the department. Everybody needs to have some kind of basic education about it. And it doesn't mean they need to be knee deep in it. But as you probably know, uh, cybersecurity has taken off and now is part of a business process. It's nothing that has to happen. It's crucial to the business. And if security is bad, and your company gets attacked and gets taken down, then you will lose revenue. So since it's a um, it's a business process, 
you really have the option to educate everybody and say, you know, apart from teaching you what we do generally as a company, we also need to teach you a little bit about security. And if you do, then hopefully you now have a few pointers how to do it um, in a better way than just uh, multiple choice click fests. So that's 45 minutes, I think, um, more or less. I'm nearly at the end because, as always, I'm speaking way faster than when I try that at home. Um, so never try it at home. Just go for it. <clears throat> the conclusion to all that is, again, that we need to get into dialogue. I know that not everybody in the infosecurity industry likes to talk to other people, and that's fine. You don't have to. But find people who know security on the one hand and who also want to talk to people like the C-level on the other hand. Because the discussion that Zoe had, um, how do I approach the C-level? That is very interesting because they won't get down to your technical level and be interested in what you do. As she said, they are going to ask, are we secure? And picking up on that, what Zoe said again is most techies won't say, yes, we are. But if you can say, well, we reasonably are, but we have this risk and we think it's, well, you just describe it in business terms with probability or what you can do against it, then they can insure against that risk. And then you can say from an overall perspective, not from a technical perspective, because we always will have bugs and holes and everything. But you can say, yeah, from a business perspective, we are as secure as we can be at the moment. We could be more secure, but then we would have to spend more money for that. And basically, we could close the company. You need to reach that point. And as a techie, and that is a hard part, you need to reach the point within yourself where you can say, yeah, I think we're reasonably secure. Because basically, if you want to be 100% secure, then you need to write how to do it. Because a lot of people would buy that book. Most people in the industry will tell you, you can never be 100% secure. And I've heard the funny, well, it's not really funny, but that's German humor for you. Mm -hmm. The funny guy uh, 10 years ago who always said when somebody said, yeah, we, are, we want to be 100% secure. And he said to the client, haha, then we take your server, dig a hole, um, dig your server, put your server in that hole and fill it out with cement. Then you are secure. It's exactly what the client wants to hear. I can tell you that. Um, and we need to really get there with our language and we need to find out what our users want and how to empower them to do that with the best security possible. I don't think it will work when we always say we want to be as secure as possible and whatever you want to do has to adapt to that. We have also to adapt to them and that is, I think, my point. So, yeah, key takeaways, conclusion, more or less the same. I've put a few links in there for you, but I'm also on Twitter. Um, info comes shortly if you have any further questions. And I'd like to talk to you if you have any other ideas how to empower your users or if you're interested in exchanging fraudulent items. We are still trying to figure out with a, with a um, reverse social engineering. We are still trying to figure out a legal way where our data protection officer is happy when we share fraudulent events with other people. Because, you know, the bad guys can break laws and they don't care about data protection. And they are so very, very well connected, whereas the good guys, so people working legally, have the utmost trouble to actually share a fraudulent event that just belongs to someone who's a criminal, but we can't give out the Ivan because we didn't ask the criminal if he's okay with that. <laughs> um, these are some funny things, but again, if you want to have um, a conversation about that, I'm going to be around. Uh, the only thing I want to mention as well is the Send Security Podcast. If you enjoyed what I'm talking about, there's more on that, together with um, Mike Goetheke from HackedFnet. And thank you very much for listening. I put that slide at the end, because if you made it through here, then you probably um, need to know who I am. If you want to uh, send me an email or a, a tweet, I'm my name is Stefan Hager. I go by the, uh, by the handle of K. I work for a company called Dativ in Germany. We are doing software for tax accountants. 
which sounds like uh, the most boring job in the world. Um, you have to imagine that this company uh, has 7,000 employees and a 1 billion euro turnover per year because, yay, taxes. I mean, Germany loves taxes and taxing. They say that 80% of world literature on tax is in German. Yay. So um, that's what I do. I'm with a team for internet security. And I'd like to thank Brian Feit for the original contributions. And most of all, you and Bisa Sleets for having me and you for listening to me. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? I don't have anything to give away apart from my laugh or a cup of water. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Nick. Your first social engineering idea. Um, keeping up the, the spirit you take into this, I think it's fucking genius. <laughs> I think he's, there's, this is something I'm talking about now, but it's around the whole concept of something that's actually sort of fights to the huge. Can you not turn the eye back into an indicator of compromise the same way we share a tax of the address and solve the questions? Does it not just be another way of seeing and can we share it that way? So just to repeat you, um, can't we use the IBAN as an indicator of compromise and then share it with others? We probably could, but my company is different from others. So um, whenever 99 lawyers say this is not something that needs to be protected, um, our company says, well, we think it is. So this is for other companies, it might be easier than for us. Okay. Good luck. Thank you. More questions? Oh, yeah. Uh, two, que uh, two questions. One of them is around the information share. So in the UK, so we have CISP, which is um, NCSC's little baby. Obviously, from the brand awareness of, a, of, a, of an organization, the fact you're feeding data into it, you get a lot of protection back from, from them for mm -hmm. any information you're sharing. So I'm just wondering whether, from your perspective, Find the German version of that would be a better way to disseminate information because it's a very close group of people who receive that information rather than just blocked out public. It's a very close group of people who are then going to do something that's actually intelligence. Um, so that's kind of what the, 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 mm -hmm. second, the second one is, is the question really is about your uh, security awareness program. The reason why businesses take on security awareness programs, so it's got an ABCD, is for metrics because the boss at the top of the tree needs to say, this year, 200 people have done it, and we have now got a better score than we did last time. Now, moving towards more, I say fluffy, I don't mean that disparaging, a fluffy kind of training model. You know, this is all what you need to kind of know. How does the boss at the top of the go, and now we're more secure because I've spent more money on this training project? Um, yeah. Uh, to your first question, I think, again, it would be easier to share information, but our company is different in that way because we do have um, misp sharing as well. Um, but with a few things like the, the IBAN, it is difficult. And the other thing is it's not our CEO who is after that metrics. It's the people responsible for internal security who have no clue about security at all. And I hope I didn't say that while the mic uh, was still open, but um, who are challenged uh, with uh, some aspects of security. Let me say, say it like that. But we are seeing that we still do both. So it's the multiple choice click fests and the virtual training company, which is mandatory. And our department does those other trainings, and we see an effect of both. Well, we, we like to think that our effect is higher in, in the end, um, and that it just doesn't only contribute to a list and to a number at the end of the day. Yeah. All right. Any more questions? Okay, I'll, I'll be around. Thank you again for your patience. Yeah.